You are now listening to Out of the Blank. blank, blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Tyrell Jackson, the youngest of the five. How we doing, everybody? So Tyrell, tell all these wonderful listeners, I think there's like one or two, how, uh, first of all, who you are and what you do professionally. All righty. Well, first of all, like you said, my name is uh, Tyrell Jackson. I... And the youngest of the Jackson Five, um, our podcast is We Know Something, uh, ran by my oldest brother, Stefan, who was on this podcast uh, earlier in the week or last week, I do believe. And yeah, so I am 20, uh, 24 years old. I actually, um, what I do professionally, I'm in the United States Army National Guard, not active duty. But I did just come back from about an 11 month deployment in Afghanistan. And now I'm continuing on with the, uh, the OGS Operation Guardian Shield border mission. And wow. yeah, that is what I'm doing right now. What are the, so what do you have to do with the border missions? Uh, so right now I'm just a support, like behind the scenes, uh, help. And it's something I really can't enclose either. So. We just um, run support for uh, Border Patrol and other agencies that uh, do this full time. That's actually their career. So, I mean, you're you're relatively close to my age. I actually, I was when I was talking to your oldest brother, uh, we were talking about kind of the different kind of connections we had. Uh, you guys do a family podcast, which is something I've never even heard of. But the fact that there's five of you and you're all still connected into each other's lives. You guys grew up very close, especially on a little bit of the reservation. And that's different from me. Like, I only have one older brother. I'm used to being the youngest. You know, you get everything last, you know, you get the hand-me-downs and, you know, you're always asked last what you want to do. It's, I mean, in any way, can you relate to that? Actually, it's kind of uh, vice versa for me (laughs) because, um, Growing up, me being the youngest, you know, I, I got the baby treatment. You know, I was a uh, mama's mama's baby. Growing up, um, you know, whatever we, uh, whatever we wanted to do, I was always asked the first one to do. I got the best stuff because once again, I was the baby, and the babies in my family were, were treated, I guess you could say, with favoritism, or I wouldn't say more love, but with uh, favoritism in my family, so. You know, there's a slight bit, a little bit more love your way. You know that. Come on. <laughs> I, nah. I always like, I always like being the little one because then I could always blame something on the older one because he was supposed to know better. Oh, yeah. So if I did something stupid, I was like, oh, because he said I could, and the next thing you know, he's ye- he's getting yelled at. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, the rules apply here. When so I know your older brother is a, a a little bit older than you by like a good is it like five or six years. 10 actually 10 years okay so that means he's probably out of the house you were probably which one did you really bond with the most so it would probably be your your second the the second youngest in your family one of your sisters right so they i guess you can say that because um they they all hold like a different place in my heart too because you know growing up um and our last podcast we actually did we talked about uh, uh living in the city which is uh, we all kind of followed followed to once we graduated and whatnot. So like my brother, he was the first one to start living in the city. Then followed him was my uh, oldest sister, Nicole. She went and moved to the city. So uh, growing up, the majority of the time I spent was with my sister, Kaya. She's uh, the second youngest. She's the youngest uh, female in my family. But overall, she's the second youngest. And so growing up, she's the one I spent the time with the most. And we all came under one roof into the valley or into the city, city life. Um, my sister Abby was the one I kind of, uh, kind of looked up to or whatever like that, just cause, uh, she was always cool, laid back to earth person. And then, um, when my brother came back from the Navy, uh, 
you know, I didn't spend a whole lot of time with him, like while he was in the Navy. So when he came back, he was another person I spent a lot of time with. Now I live with my sister, Nicole, and, you know, me and her are pretty close right now. So I know because my different, brother, different. Well, my brother's older than me by four years. So I knew like right when we were kind of very little, we were really connected. Then once you kind of start hitting your teens, like when he was hitting his teenage years, he was kind of distant, distancing himself. You know, you get a car you get all these types of things. And then eventually he moved out. And I was like, damn, right when we were getting along, finally, after all these years of fighting, you know, we finally got to connect. And then he kind of moved out of the house. And, you know, it's it's kind of the same way, like your brother being older by 10 years. He was still a part of your life, but he obviously had to go off and do his own adult things. Yes. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about the reservation you guys grew up on. So explain this to me. So like... I know you had a bunch of family living on this place, but I mean, were you guys really that connected 24 seven? Yeah, pretty much. Like, um, if we weren't in school, AKA like on the weekend and stuff like that, you know, it's one thing each uh, family member did was uh, get ready in the morning and then go to grandma's house for the weekend. So that's where we met up with all of our cousins, all our uh, aunts and uncles, my grandma and grandpa. So you literally could not get away with anything. If you did something wrong, somebody was telling on you. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I was listening to your last podcast and you guys were talking about like, you, you had a story about him as getting uh, picked up um, off the front porch or off the front steps of this apartment you guys were living in by a stranger who was offering pizza. And I'm like, I've had those moments. I've had those moments. I, I, I'm, I'm usually like, I wouldn't say the, the dumb one, but the funny one, but I'm also like pretty trusting and I'm not kind of aware of a lot of danger. So I'm like, yeah, when a guy offers candy, man, I mean, it, it, I can only get in if he's got butterscotch or something. <laughs> yeah. Just be, uh, on that note, because, uh, you know, on the reservation, not only are we close with our family, but we're close with people like around where we live in, you know, like a regular neighborhood. So, you know, we go like riding our bikes and then it, it was actually normal for us to uh, walk into someone's house without, you know, being or doing the polite thing and doing the right thing and knocking. You know, we actually walk into someone's house and just go straight to the person's room. Yeah, you so I kind of care. You usually find that connectivity with like a best friend or something. They just open up your door and then walk up into your room like, hey, what's up? And you're just like in bed like, what? But, you know, it's crazy because trying to adjust from that lifestyle to moving somewhere else or moving out on your own, it's kind of, it's, it, do you feel like you're a little bit, a little bit more open, I guess you would say to some people? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as what my siblings call me a social butterfly, just because I don't, there's really no reason not to talk to anybody in my mind. So that's kind of what I carried over going into the city life. Um, that we started off in an apartment and then, you know, you see a pool, a kid goes crazy for a pool. Um, yeah. So by them meaning I'm playing Frogger, uh, they mentioned I was playing Frogger in the street. You know, I always had like a basketball or something with me or like a skateboard and, you know, you're not perfect at everything. So you miss the ball and the ball goes rolling into the street and, you know, without hesita hesitation, I go running out after the ball so yeah I, that's what they meant by like then me giving them heart attacks and stuff like that so i was a daredevil yeah that was kind of me too like for i was basically the test subject for every type of uh little fun activity we did outside like hey let's put a sprinkler under the trampoline next thing you know robbie breaks his arm and it's <laughs> it was i was always the ones that was doing the stunts doing the crazy things i was kind of seen as the outlandish and funny one which i think is basically the case with most youngest siblings yeah and not to like throw shade on any of my siblings either but i'm also the smallest of the five you're the smallest even of your sisters too yes oh man i i got the i got the grandparent genes i guess like that um growing up i was always small um up until i hit a freshman year of high school i was always within the hundred pound range and then freshman year, I think I gained like 10 pounds. So I was like 110. By the time I graduated, I was 140. So I, I until now, like I actually like uh, had a little bit of a growth spurt going into the military. And, and 
and plus, you know, that kind of beat to the food. There's not exactly, I guess the most nutritious. It's mostly like you get a heavy carb and then they feed you a little bit of protein. So you're kind of, you're putting on a little bit of pounds when you go into the military. Yeah. Yeah. What made you decide to even join into the military just because your brother was in the Navy? Actually. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Kind of uh, growing up, we really didn't have like, or I didn't at least have uh, a father figure in my life just because uh, the dad wasn't there. I mean, I knew of him and whatnot. I knew he was my dad, but, you know, he wasn't really there. And so then my, uh, the next person in line was my brother. So, you know, I kind of wanted to be like someone in my family. And, you know, he was in the military. He comes back and he's buffed and shredded and all that. And I was like, oh, I want to be like that too. So he, when he came back, he put me through like a, his little workout routine that they do in the Navy. So. And now you can, something I wanted. You can have moments with friends. You can have moments with family. True connectivity, you know, where you bond with each specific member of that family. Like you have one with, if you have one with like your dad or your oldest brother, you probably have multiple just with each individual sibling of yours. Like where you are on your own connectivity with them. Like you guys could basically speak your own language. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's different because you see like with, with your two sisters, probably like they fight, you know, or three sisters, they, they fight, you know, they have these little side back and forth and you know, which side you would take over the other one, even if they're in the wrong, you know, like me and my brother, like, you know, we don't have any other siblings, but I always wonder what it would be like to have like a third, like a middle child in there. Yeah. So if my oldest brother was the middle one, there'd be one older than him. So then I was like, whenever he beat me up, I always had the oldest brother to run to. So you could be, <laughs> oh yeah. That's the one thing. Like my sisters are like you know the protective people of me, because my brother, you know, he he's a he's a guy that grew up with wrestling and whatnot. So, I like you said, being the test dummy earlier, I was the test dummy for like all his wrestling moves and one hey. of his favorite people to practice all that stuff on. So he, he sees when something I got on hurt, TV and he throws you down into the mat. Yep. And so then, like when my sister saw that they go over and run to my protection so yeah it made you feel good because i mean if, like i would always try to run to my parents or something the next thing i know he's like mom and dad aren't home i'm like oh shit this is, this is <laughs> yep. about to go bad i I, yep. I find it fun because like where you still might have like similarities in your you know features like your hair your eyes your color whatever that you can get from your parents or even your grandparents like you were saying it's cool to see how even though you guys are pretty similar, that you guys are all different in your own unique way. Yeah. Like, I know your brother tries to run the podcast. Like, I was listening. And it seems like he was, like, the main guy trying to keep everybody on a thing. Everybody else is kind of in the background. And then there was you a little bit. I was trying to I was trying to get a little information on you, do a little background research. I was like, all right, what, what, what about Ty? And he just kind of would come in with these one-liners that are hilarious. And I'm like, that's the youngest kid for sure. <laughs> He's always looking for, like, the right time just to say one thing that's going to make everybody laugh. That's good to know. Well, yeah, you're a funny guy. So, t- t- what 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 interests you, man? Because I mean, your brother was telling me some stuff that interests him. I want to see if you guys are similar. Yeah, one actually similarity that we both share is uh, fishing. We we both love to fish. Now, how um, do you fish, man? That is the most tasking process in the world. I can understand it if you got it from like a maybe a bonding with like a father or bonding with like an older brother. But for me, like the only good story I have of fishing is I pulled a trash can out of out of where I was fishing at. Instead of catching a fish, <laughs> I caught a ten pound garbage basically bin. Well, yeah, like um growing up, um when all the like the boys would hang out, we would hang out with our grandpa and our uncle Chat, who and one episode we mentioned to him, but yeah, uh, one thing they always did was uh, take us fishing. When we go camping, we always would go fishing. So even my grandma, uh, before she passed, uh, she always had had a knowledge of uh, how to fish. So uh, oh. it's something we've always done. And then, you know, like once we got the hang of it or whatever like that, uh, when I graduated high school, I went and got myself a job over at uh, Bass Pro Shops, the Outdoor World Store. And uh, I actually worked in the fishing department. So that's something we both took advantage of, right? Because I ended up getting a pretty good discount working there. So 
oh, we use that discount and stocked up on a lot of fishing gear. You know, we started actually try to fish competitively. So that's something we do now. Um, we, we enter in like uh, fishing tournaments and stuff like that. And then we try to compete against each other too. So it's who can catch the biggest fish, who can catch the most fish, who can catch the fish on a certain type of bait. So something like that. I mean, with me and my brother, it was always a competitive thing. I could not even picture what it had to be growing up with four other siblings trying to have a competitive edge. Everybody's got to be going like, oh, I'm better at this. I'm better at that. Everybody's proving themselves. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's always the funnest aspect, too. Like, you know, nowadays, like, I mean, I'm 21 years old, but like our family's not close anymore. Like nobody's really close. It seems like in society today, people like families that are coming. I mean, they don't eat seven days a week together anymore. They only eat maybe three because Netflix is more important. Like it's really strange to see how connected you guys are. Like even when you guys are apart, you guys are still messaging each other, keeping connected. I mean, it's basically cheaper by the dozen, like all those kids in one house. Yeah. Now with me, like the, and they're also like my friends too, because like, uh, you know, friends I see every now and then we talk every now and then, but with my siblings, I talk to you every single day and it's not face to face, but like you said, it's through a, a messaging because we have a, a messenger thread and it's called the Jackson five. And that's how we all communicate. It's crazy. Cause you know, people grow up and then they totally lose the family that was impacted in their life the most. They just don't talk to them anymore. Next thing you know, you meet them at like a family gathering three years later, find out they had a kid. It's like, whoa, what happened? You know, it's crazy to see that. Like that's happening more and more in the world today. Like coming from a giant family like yourself, how do you even picture that? Like not talking to your family for years. I can't, (laughs) I do. I can't picture that. Just because I know they're always going to be there and I'll, I'll be there too. So I know, yeah. it's kind of hard picture that. So I always try and bring up the example. Like you can live every single day, spend every single hour in, your, in the house with your family together. Someone's reaching for a butter knife. But at the same time, even if you guys get into a fight, it was always cool. Like for me, if I got into a fight with my brother, I knew if someone messed with me or someone messed with him, I'll be right at his side, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> It's it's crazy to see because always the, me being the youngest one, you know, trying to be funny. I would always be a little too funny in a way that's not supposed to be funny. And the next thing I know, bam, I'm getting into a giant conflict or something, and my older brother has to bail me out. I'll never forget when I was in high school, and uh, well, it was the one year uh, when I was a freshman. My brother was a senior. Every time I saw him in the hallway, and he'd just look at me. He's like, "Don't talk to me. Don't talk to me." We can't associate. I was like, people know we ride the bus together. People know we get off on the same street and people know we live together. So it's like, you can't talk to me here. He's like, no, stop, stop. You're a nerd. Get away. Get away. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's how it was with uh, my sister Kaya and myself. She's the, like I said, the, the second youngest. Just because we're so closer in age, she was the only one I actually went to school with. So... That's, she's the only one I really had that experience with. And we didn't really talk that much either. One class, we actually had the same class with each other. It was a Spanish class. And we didn't even talk during that that class either. Yeah, it's, it's, it's also the fact that like you're also trying to become your own adult when you're a kid. So by the time you hit your teenage years, you're trying to disconnect from your family as much as possible. Obviously, still keep them in your lives, but you're still trying to live your own individual life, which makes it kind of hard. Uh, I guess to say when you, when you guys are so connected, you, you still want to branch off and do your own thing. You still have to leave eventually, but you don't ever lose touch with them in your life, which is, I think is pretty awesome. Yeah, it is. Like coming from, you know, just having an older sibling that kind of did his own thing. He was all into music. I'm all into, you know, I was into at the time video games, going to the gym, doing these types of things. And it was still cool to know that like, if I was ever in a tight jam, like he knows, even though we don't really talk that much now that he can always text me, he can always hit me up and I'll be right at his side. And it's crazy to see that like now he has a kid and I've become an uncle. Like just even hearing that you're now uncle Rob. I'm like, Oh God, what does that mean? Does that mean I have to start pulling out a walker and start walking around the house? So Tyrell, yeah. I mean, you, you got, you got to, you got to, you got to, if you want to feel like steering this thing, feel like steering it, dude. If you want to ask me anything or bring up anything, dude, I'm trying to, 
trying to trying to find what will get you talkative the most because you you are playing a little shy subject here. Oh, well, I apologize for being shy, even though I'm so called the social butterfly. Yeah, but, the social butterfly uh, has not broken out of the cocoon yet. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, what about you? What do you What do you do? I know. Besides this podcast, what else do you have? My average day job. I mean, I work at a hotel, so I experience you know all types of people. You know, it's not it's not something I want to do. Honestly, when I started podcasting, was something interesting because like the way you guys kind of started, it's a way of kind of connecting. I just found that it's really interesting to find out stuff about people. I guess you could call me a social butterfly too, but. Just it was just the concept of you hear so many stories and experiences and different things that people are interested in that really spark your interest. I mean, you work in the military. Is this something you wanted to do when you were a kid? Oh, uh, ever since uh, Stefan was in the military, yeah, that's something I wanted to do. But uh, you know, I probably want a little bit more in life now. You know, like I in the in the military, I work in the medical field. I am a medic. And so, you know, that's something I want to do now. My mom is a nurse, so you kind of combine the two, and it works because, you know, there are doctors and there are nurses in the military. So, Now, what, what, what types of things have you learned in the medical field while joining the military? Uh, the main thing is trauma. Um, you can ask me any question about trauma, and I can probably give you a solid answer. So what's, what do you find the most fascinating about trauma? How there's a, like um, always something new. <laughs> yeah, know, just uh, there's there's always something you know because there's now first of all like I, what uh, what uh, what really gets me fascinated is the med- is like the brain. Okay, the human brain is something we barely understand. Like the fact that I could hit my brain in a certain way. Next thing you know, I could speak a whole different language. Like you ever heard of foreign accent syndrome? Uh, yeah, actually, I have. Like that stuff's fascinating because we're trying to explore space. Okay, we got Elon Musk making multiple Teslas that can drive themselves. Eventually, you're never gonna have to leave your home. I'm like, hold on a second. Let's not worry about space travel, turning ourselves into robots, but let's focus on the main thing, like in our head right now. Like this is something we barely understand. The fact that some people can see, like music, like notes, can literally see it floating in the air, like that boggles my mind. Oh yeah, and I'm one of my buddies, or not really a buddy anymore, but a, a person I grew up with. He actually had the has this uh, thing. It's called a eidetic memory, you know. So he's actually a very smart person, and partially due to his uh, eidetic memory, and it's just like pictographic stuff, you know. He can have flashes of pictures and store them in his uh, brain as like a memory file, and go back to them whenever he needs to. It's pretty crazy and it's amazing at the same time. It's good for cheating on tests, too. You just look at a book at one point, <laughs> and next you know, bam, got all the answers. Yeah, that's how he's really smart, actually. He's, you know, studying to be a doctor right now, so that's, that's good on him. Now, do you want to keep going in the medical field in the military, or do you want to kind of verge off into maybe join the medical industry, like when it comes to being a doctor? So I, I thought about being a doctor, and to, in all honesty, I actually uh, just lost native motivation to go to school that long. Just to be like a general practitioner is about uh, eight plus years of schooling. So that's after your undergrad. So after you, you know, you do your three, four years of uh, college, get your bachelor's degree. It's another four years in medical school, plus another two to six years in your residency. Once you finish your residency, then you could uh, do your one year of fellowship for uh, a general practitioner. So for me, I just I don't see myself going to school for that long. So the what I actually uh, want to do, want to do now, as is after joining the military, was a as a physician assistant. They still you still hold the title of a medical provider, but um, you're not a doctor. So do you find that you like kind of watching and then helping where you can rather than taking the full on kind of leadership role. So that's, that's what a physician assistant does. Actually, they do take on the leadership role when the doctor is not there. So they, they can sign off on everything, do almost everything a doctor does, but they don't, you know, they don't have the authority to uh, 
like own their own practice or when it comes to malpractice and everything like that, that's all the doctors work. Oh, you're more connected into like the personal relationship with the client. Yes. Yeah, because a part of what's wrong with the medical industry is the fact that doctors have where they used to have maybe six or seven patients, um, they were able to kind of connect and, you know, be able to create a relationship with their patients. Now, a doctor basically has nine or 10 patients, and all they have to do is read it off a chart. The nurse's job now is to get all the information, see what you're allergic to, and basically give all the information, get to know you as a person, then feed it over to the doctor where he can come in and make a diagnosis real quick and then move on to the next patient. Yep. I have a buddy that works in emergency trauma, and he was talking about how like in in think towards the ending of 2019 heading into 2020 he says there's going to be the most recorded amount of medical professional professionals out of business based on people that are going to retire uh there's a whole generation like i don't know if they're called the baby boomers that are going out but it's going to leave literally the medical industry with a big hit um on people uh in there and Part of the reason is too, I mean, they talk about them working 48 hours or like 36 hour shifts and it's only on the basis of their shift ends at a reasonable time. It's just, they have to keep on staying there until everyone's not in critical condition. And like I I chalk it up, like technically we're all in critical condition all the time. Even the person that's sitting in their house, even I'm in critical condition right now because we're walking around, not handling stress well. We're not handling like physical trauma well. I mean, the, the fact that all that stuff that's coming out about like, did you hear about the boxer that died from CT? Yeah, yeah. That stuff's insane. Like for years and years and years, these things have been happening. It's like we're not even completely understanding what's going on around us. There's new information, like you said, being coming out every single day. And it's like, at, at one point, we need to focus a lot more research into that. Did, did you hear what um, they recently got done in China? They have a brain transplant surgery? Uh, no, actually, I have not heard up they, on that yet. They There's a doctor here that tried. So it's like the start of stem cells. I don't know if you know a whole lot about stem cells. But yep. before that was popular here, they started over in China. They started over in a foreign country because it wasn't ethical here. It was against human rights. So. With the brain transplant surgery, it was started by an American doctor, but he started it in China, and he started it on dogs and monkeys. And what he would do is he would basically be able to take the spine, all that stuff out, fix it, like if a monkey was maybe like had no legs or something or didn't wasn't able to use his legs, and they would put it back, and then the monkey could walk again. And they just moved up to human trials. I heard that. I was like, look, we're heading into some Terminator God-like stuff right now. Like, this is way oh, yeah. beyond our capabilities. I, I, I like, Because I, I wanted to be a doctor for a good bit um, on the concept of, like, I was not, like, blood doesn't affect me. None of that stuff scares me. I'm always able to kind of, like, work past it. You know, I was the one that was, first of all, getting injured all the time. I was basically like, oh, yeah, test subject. Same here. So that was me in high school. Um, you know, I, so I made the visit to the chiropractor, to the orthopedic office uh, every, like almost like what it felt like almost every month, you know, just a like, injury here, injury there. So, you know, I kind of grew to, grew to that. And that's kind of how I wanted to be in the uh, medical field also, because, uh, when I when I'm in the office, I'm listening to this doctor and listening to this nurse, like you know, throw a bunch of uh, jargon that I have no idea what it means. But I hear my mom talking with them because she's a nurse also. So I'm like, oh, okay, seems cool. Maybe I want to do this. There was three things that always freaked me out about uh, getting hurt to a point where like I needed a chiropractor. I don't like people around my spine because I've seen too many movies and shows where someone cracks somebody's neck, like snaps it like you would if you were going to like kill somebody and then something like pops and it goes wrong. I'm like, nope, that's good. Second would be acupuncture. I actually talked to a person that is in the acupuncture field and he's been doing about 30 years of research and working with his own company uh, doing acupuncture. I was like, I've seen Final Destination. I saw when the guy fell off the table. It's not for me. And then CAT scan machines always scare the crap out of me because they make the loudest possible noise and they don't do anything to you physically. They just scan you with this like, I don't know if it's radiation or 
something, but I don't like it when I have to take my pants off, my shirt off, and then put a gown on that is really uncomfortable to get into a machine. It's just, I, I mean, I'm, I'm more accepting of taking candy from a stranger than hopping into an MRI. Oh, yeah. But that's the thing with the CAT scan. It's the X-ray and the CAT scan, those are probably two of like the quickest machines, whereas the MRI, that almost like took me an hour just to get images of my knee. And they put you in this like, small little confined machine telling you, like, keep your arms above your head. And they th- throw you in this tube and they're playing some music that is really, it's like elevator music. I was listening to <laughs> elevator music for an hour and a half and I asked her, she's like, would you like to listen to a radio station? I was like, if you're going to put on Spotify, could you put on like some Red Hot Chili Peppers or something I, I enjoy? She's like, for sure. And I was like, okay, cool. And then as we start, she just starts playing like this really, really crappy elevator music. I'm like, oh no. She's going to change it. She's going to change it. And then an hour later, I'm like, you didn't change it. <laughs> I think what scares a lot yeah, of people, so. I think what scares a lot of people about the medical industry is the fact that like, it, it's, there's all this bad stuff coming about it, like about medicating first and doing all these things, like throwing pills at someone first, which we tend to do, but it's on the concept of the fact that it's very hard for a doctor to treat you with so many patients. It's easier for them to give you a prescription for what they like the template, what they think works, rather than yeah. get to know your history behind it. There's actually a really good experiment. I think it was called the Rosenhan experiment. Um, they took about 20 nurses and they they basically tested authority. So they would tell the nurses by like an authoritative figure, like, hey, you're gonna give your patient this. Okay, knowing that that dosage that they told them to give that patient could kill them, but it really wasn't the actual drug. It was like a sugar pill. So Mm -hmm. 18 out of the 20 nurses did it based on the fact that one of their superiors told them to, even though they knew it could injure that patient, it could be a lethal dose. Two of them did the morally right thing. I heard that and I was like, it's time to start taking psychology class and figure out why that is. I th- I think it's it, it's a it, you know people look at nurses and they think of like a woman's job. I'm like actually nurses are some of the most impactful people. Um, it could be a guy. I, I have a bunch of guy friends that are all nurses and you know emergency trauma specialists. And I'm like, it, it's on the concept of you want to create more of a personal relationship with somebody rather than trying just learn everything about them, looking at them like a machine. Like you basically are a mechanic. You are looking at someone like a bunch of parts, but at the same time, you have to know the ins and outs of the person, their medical history, you know, a little bit about their personal life. Like, especially like me, I wanted to be a therapist when I was uh, younger. So I was always fascinated with like, why does that person feel like that? Why does that person act like that? Why is that guy so angry at this woman with 13 items in the 12 item or less? It's like, there's got to be something else working in the midst. And that's when it comes to the physical and the mental part of the human body that I find fascinating. Yeah. What do you find the most fascinating, I guess, would be physical or mental? Physical, because I'm, you know, I'm a hands-on type of person. Uh, One way I learn well is, you know, a lot of hands-on stuff. So I'm, and like I said, uh, with medicine, there's something always, always new coming in. So, um, men- like mentally too, there's always a lot of new stuff too. That's where psychology and uh, uh, psychiatry come in too. So. so, so what types of things have you worked on? Like, especially with like a patient, have you had any hands-on experience? I mean, I know you're in the medical field, but have you had any hands-on, you know, training besides just you know the basic routines to kind of get the kind of title in the medical field in the uh you're in the army right yes yeah so to get the type of experience you would need to be like a medic in the army what types of things have you kind of worked on so before i actually uh deployed with my unit uh i'm an lpn Uh, so what i did was work in the hospital on the um cardiac floor pretty much i guess you can break it down and stuff like that Uh, i worked on the cardiac floor and uh worked as a resource nurse there so um if a nurse was unavailable because she was busy with one patient and the other patient needed care then i would go and uh, assist that nurse and take care of that patient have you had any uh, that's what i situations sorry one more time 
have you had any crazy situations like a nurse is unavailable at the time and you're the only one there and this guy's going to like maybe some serious route like a cardiac arrest or something yeah actually that's where uh we did a you know what in the hospital is what's called the code blue um pretty much like once you hit the button the alarm goes off in the entire hospital and any available nurse uh comes rushing the respiratory therapist the lines team everyone everyone starts cramming into this room trying to uh, revive the person trying to uh what do you call that reset the heart so that's uh, i've had two of those working in the hospital that's kind of a scary situation the fact that like, um, it's overwhelming first of all you have so many things and everyone's kind of relying on everyone to do their part like you got to make sure you're 100 percent in the game and it's hard to kind of do that like it's where um i've seen like some nurses like when i visited a hospital on a field trip when i was a kid so i mean i got the kid experience but it was some person like someone was going to cardiac arrest going to shock or something and all these there's just one like student that just went up and then he just started backing away, just immediately started giving up, and they're trying to snap him out of it. And I was like, I get it, though, because you do get a little bit of tunnel vision, but you get so overwhelmed, you don't know what to do. You just freeze up. Yeah, that's the thing in the medical field, too. You train and train and train and train, and sometimes they feel that's all you do. But when it comes to the real-life situation, you know, it it's probably cold feet because that was probably his first time doing it, but, you know, if he was to, were to ever do it again, I'm pretty sure he would get uh, get pat down with it. So, yeah, because you can study as much and as possible and get the best grades, but when it comes down to it actually happening in front of you, it's a completely different scenario. I mean, it's all about kind of acting in the moment. You got to hope that intelligence hits you right on the fly, and you're reacting just as fast as you're thinking it. Yeah, just because when when you study and study and study, you don't get how at that moment, adrenaline is going to hit you or how nervous you're going to be too, because, you know, pretty much that person's life lies in your hands at that moment. So. Yeah. A lot of people, um, like are pro for what they're doing now with virtual reality. Uh, they're using virtual reality simulators, like the kind of like the games, but they're using it in the surgery field. So they'll be able to give a surgeon hands-on experience without actually having to deal with it when it does arise. And they kind of make it like the Star Trek simulator where it's like impossible to beat because it's an always ever changing outcome. They do that with the simulation. So, you know, you're working on like a gastric bypass, or you're working on something and something goes wrong. And then each time you do it, it's something different. It's always a random outcome. You never know what's going to happen. You know, you could have zigged and you could have zagged and it keeps on ever changing, which keeps making that experience keep going. So you don't just get used to the same thing and then eventually beat it. I, I, oh, yeah. I, think, so. I, I think when it comes to the medical industry, there's a lot of innovation going on, especially for sure. I love how like with the education system, like back in the day, it was always based on like, just give them a pill, give them this, give them that. Now they're looking at the basis of nutrition, which I think is an overall giant effect into how you physically and mentally feel. You know, a lot of people that join going to a gym, start eating a healthy lifestyle. They start kind of learning a little bit about, um, how their emotions are being affected, especially like if they eat a salad, they realize they don't feel like shit after they eat, you know, a salad rather than if they ate that double cheeseburger at McDonald's. Yeah. Now, do you think that a lot kind of, I mean, you have to do your own research if you're kind of interested in the medical field. I'm guessing you've read books on it too, right? Yes, I have. So what types of things do you find the most fascinating when it comes to any type of system in the body? So I'm just because I relate to myself. I'm I like the muscus, uh, musculoskeletal system. Uh, also because you know I play sports. I've been injured. I I go to the gym. All this like comes into play. So um, you know, so I kind of like try to do my own like diagnosis of myself, which probably isn't the best thing. But you know, uh, it's always nice to 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 know and also to learn too. So. I'm a firm believer in the, uh, what is that called? It's like, see one, do one, teach one. So Yeah, for sure. Because when I first started going to the gym, I was wondering, like, why am I hurting the next day? Why am I sore? So I started picking up anatomy books. I started picking up, like, you know, 
physical fitness books. I was, I was just learning as much as I possibly can about health and fitness like when it comes down to your amino acids, down to your muscular system, down to so many factors. And I was like, oh, that's why water is beneficial because it, re- it rehydrates you, regenerates your muscles, and it helps build with recovery. Like you need a proper amount of sleep. You need a proper amount of this. And I found the more I was learning, the more I was able to kind of influence it in towards the gym and get to a better standpoint of working out, like understanding it better. You know, getting a little bit more background information. You know, I found it fascinating that like, you know, when things heal, like when the muscles, it's all about cells, you know, regenerating and kind of recovering. And that that, that, that stuff just boggles my mind because there's so much information, like you said, that keeps coming out every single day. It makes it very, very difficult to feel like you've kind of mastered it. I mean, I remember when I got my associate's degree, I trying to get a job, I thought doors were just going to open up. Next thing it's like, oh, you need a bachelor's degree. And I'm like, well, then when I get my bachelor's, it's going to be, I'm going to need my master's. And then eventually it's going to keep on pushing the block farther and farther. Yeah. But it's, you know, the more, the more, you know, the more you can do kind of thing. So are you the only one in your family that kind of likes the aspect of medical, uh, kind of this, job career or is there someone else in your family that does yeah i mean my uh, my mom's the only other uh, health care professional in, in our family um but abby she is actually going to school she wants to be a pharmacist i guess you want to say because she's in the farmers uh, pharmacy tech field right now so uh, furthering her education, she does want to be a pharmacist. So, you know, that's more along the, uh, the medication side. Yeah, because um, I've, I've podcast with a couple of uh, pharmacology people and they always say like, you know, it's it's really strange because a lot of the people that deal with pharmacology, they just, they're usually writing off a prescription for what's given to them by a doctor. And a lot of them I found fascinated that they kind of want to dive a little bit more into the big pharma industry. Like all the things that come out, like, you know, just got released with Johnson and Johnson faking, uh, you know, results and stuff kind of hindering the actual effects and the drug awareness problem, the opioid addiction that's going on. And I was like, there are people out there in the medical industry to trust. There are people out there that, you know, in different positions that do have a better understanding of what it means to be like kind of relatable to people rather than just there for the paycheck. I just think sadly nowadays when it comes to anything in the world today, it's way easier to be comfortable and get that paycheck rather than go out of your way to do it the right way or really do it just to help another person out. Oh, yeah. But that's that's also one thing like the medical field, you know, a lot of these things really interest people, you know. Um, so you want to like affect change in other people's lives, you go to school to be a doctor. And it's like I said, it's going to take you a long time to be a doctor. But, you know, you're, that's what actually interests you. Yeah. Cause and so you- whereas the PA, the PA comes into play, PAs are, like I said, are more hands on. You also get more relationship time with the with the patient. So that's where I want to, I want to fall into play. So does that deal with physical therapy too? Um, so the physician assistant, like I said, it's the assistant of the doctor. It's kind of like, so you have the state surgeon, then you have the deputy state surgeon. So the physician assistant would be the deputy state surgeon, like all, all the things that the doctor would do if the doctor is not there, the physician, the physician assistant would pick up on. So, yeah, because a physician oh. assistant works kind of with the with a licensed physician, uh, like you were saying. But so you, you do like the diagnosing, the treating of the illness, and then performing physical examinations and kind of helping out in surgeries. Exactly. So, but where a doctor really gets kind of like the overall, I guess, title or kind of run the room a little bit, you still have one of the most important jobs because you're doing a lot of his work kind of for him in a way if he's not able to be there. Yeah, that's that's I mean, that's that's like a that's like one of those roles, like a Clint Eastwood role. Like you're not trying to claim the title, but you want to let people know you're doing something. I like that because, I mean, like I said before, a lot with like the nursing program, it gets kind of swooped under because they're known as a nurse. Like the title's not as effective as doctor, even though they might be doing twice the work. Oh, yeah. Do you find that you kind of want to, you know, dive a little bit more into like the PA thing rather than branch off into the military. I know you just got back from your, your 11th month trip and all, 
but it kind of coming back, kind of being away from it for a little bit, do you feel like going back to that or do you kind of want to join like more of a hospital type scenario? So actually I kind of stepped away from the hospital scenario. Uh, I, like I said, I'm on the border mission now. I still continue to, uh, to do the military thing because not only am I like interested in, uh, in like health and medicine and everything like that, but you know, just, uh, also having that, the knowledge of uh, how tactics and everything else, you know, in our military work. So now, with the border, um, the border scenario, is that dealing with immigration as well? Um, you know, I'm actually not 100 percent sure because this is something I just jumped on uh, about a month and a half ago. So. Like I'm still like learning the ins and outs of everything of that. Um, I do know uh, we help we help with a uh, counter drug. I, like I said, we do help with the um, border patrol along the uh, the southern border, and this all stretches from Texas all the way to Arizona. So we're in the Arizona portion is where I'm at. Yeah, because I was wondering because you you come from a giant connected family. So you guys are all about like you have obviously really good family values, family morals, these types of things. And a lot of what comes on with immigration is usually someone trying to get their family over to a better place to have them start a better life rather than where they would be if they stayed in the same location. And I'm pro immigration on the concept of I've met some pretty fascinating people from another country. You know, some of the most morally and like least family ethical people are from uh, different heritages than me. Mine, where my family's kind of disconnected, my buddy has family dinners every single night and they invite me over, even though I'm not considered blood. And that always that always was something, you know, I always gave humans the best aspect of because we do have a deep down passionate thing inside of us to care about one another. But the way we kind of walk around the world today, we don't ever take really a time to have a conversation or even be able to get to know one another. Yeah, true. So, yeah. Well, Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that um, you know you can in the military you can have all of that, all of the um, compassion and thinking you want, but what it comes down to you you are owned by the government. So uh, I don't I don't think we deal with uh, immigration. I think they still go through uh, um, border patrol and also immigration through that, but. You know, we're just there behind the scenes assisting Border Patrol. So, like, um, uh, you know, doing, like, the, the hard work that they would normally do. So. I got you. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of people, when they look at the government, they say the government's a problem. I'm like, it's not really a problem. It's people are kind of a problem. We're a little bit disconnected. Like, you know, a lot of people, like, they grow up especially like kids nowadays, they grow up with a tablet or a phone shoved in their face. So they're not really paying attention to anything when it comes to, you know, playing ball or, you know, maybe chasing a sibling round with like poop on a stick or something. You know, those types of moments that you experience like when you're a kid, like I, I just was on the cusp of that. Like me and my brother would still go outside and play. I remember on Father's Day, I got stitches in my knee because he was going to lock me outside of the house and we're racing back to the house. I remember tripping and falling and just landing on this giant brick little like fence thing and went right into my knee. And my dad just pulled in the driveway on Father's Day and he saw it happen. And before you could even drop the keys or anything, he was like, all right, I'm just going to start the car again. <laughs> and we had to drive right to the hospital. But like those moments, you know, the moments I have with my brother, like where they might be like when I talk to him, like I tried to podcast with him. And this is when I said, I'll never podcast with my family. Because I'm sitting there and he's giving me one word responses. I'm like, tell me about what interests you. And he's like, uh, you know what interests me. I'm like, I know I do. I know. I know. I'm, I'm trying to get the information out there. And I was like, what's one moment in your life where you had like a complete realization? Like, this is, this is, this is awesome. I'm living on the moment. And he goes, I remember when you went to go, when you were brushing your teeth, when dad was in the bathroom, he was brushing his teeth. You went to spit out your toothpaste and he did at the same time. And he spit it right in your hair. 
And I was like, that was one of your moments that made you come to like the realization that this is awesome. Like, this is the best thing. Like, this is, I'm glad to be alive. And he's like, yeah, that was pretty cool. I was like, your son not being born was one of them. He was like, that's up there. But let me tell you, that was a funny moment. I'm like, okay. Like, it's, it's those types of stories you have with your siblings that are honestly kind of the best ones to look back on. Like, I, I remember like all the moments me and my brother fought. But I, I remember so much more the impactful moments of just me and my brother hanging out and just being able to kind of have that connection. I mean, you know, my brother's into music, but we bonded over playing video games. I'll never forget um, when we were growing up, we'd always play video games. We'd always make taquitos. And then when he kind of moved out, he came back after a couple of years. And this time I'm around 17 years old. I'm kind of my last years of high school. And I remember he just looked at me. He goes, taquitos. I'm like, taquitos next thing you know we're sitting in front of the xbox we have one of those giant like turkey dinner <laughs> plates and we have the taquitos lined up all the way down the plate and as he's working from one end i'm working from the other end and the next thing you know you see we get right down to the last taquito in the middle and it was always funny because like he would just pop it in the microwave for like 30 minutes and then next you know you like got the ones on the end that were super super hot and then as you worked your way in they were super cold and we didn't care, yeah. man. It was just kind of having those moments with your siblings because this stuff, like I'm pretty sure you probably have a moment with each and every single one of your siblings individually, then together. And I always bring up to the fact, like, even if you have a best friend or if you have someone that you don't talk to every single day, but, you know, you guys aren't connected anymore, especially when people get out of high school, it's hard to stay kind of connected. But you always know you can rely on that person. You know, it could be months and then you send them a text or something and there it's like that time never even happened. Oh yeah. but Well, I mean, I, I appreciate you doing my podcast, man. I, I hope it was uh, good, as good as experience it was for you. I mean, I'm definitely at least a little bit happier here just getting to sit down with you for a little bit. I know you're kind of said you were limited on time, but I appreciate you doing the podcast, man. Yeah, man. No problem, Robbie. Hey, um, I want to give you here a second at the end if you want to promote your own podcast because I know you got you got your own. Yeah, so uh, just real quick, uh, like I said in the beginning, you know, me and my siblings, uh, the five of us, we call ourselves the Jackson Five because we sh we all share the last name, and once again, we are all siblings, all within ten years of each other, and by that I mean age. Uh, we all do this podcast. It's called or titled We Know Some Things. You can find us on uh, Anchor or Apple Play or yeah, Apple Play. Um, we have social media. It's uh, We Know Some Things on Facebook, on Instagram. It's We underscore No underscore Some underscore Things. And that's a long name. It's a very but long yeah, name. So, a, lot, a lot of underscores too. Why don't they just let you just put a space in All right. <laughs> it makes yeah. it so much harder yeah. to hashtag. Yeah, and then also on uh, Spotify, too. You can come check us out on any of those platforms. So uh, we've been more than happy. Uh, we try to be uh, as funny as we can, but mostly, you know, it all just blurts out. And uh, whatever comes off, uh, comes from, uh, from our minds, we speak. So come give us a, a good listen. We're all out of Arizona. And, yeah. Well, thanks so much for being on the podcast, Tyrell. Hey, man, no problem. You have yourself a wonderful day.